You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Well, God bless you, and welcome to Treasures in Heaven. From all of us at WCAT Radio, we're glad you're with us. I am your host, Dr. William Ailes. Tonight, we have with us a special guest, Teresa Revezzo. I know Teresa to be a dedicated, faithful, and passionate follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. I met her on the phone when I was invited to participate in her phone Bible study. Teresa, along with a Catholic friend, started this study at the onset of the COVID isolation to be connected with other people of faith in and around New York City. Soon after joining her Bible study, I told Teresa that my life is blessed knowing her and the others on the line. Frankly, it has been pure joy to give to and receive from these wonderful, faithful believers. I've also had the chance to hear the various ways that Teresa exercises her faith, seeking to connect others to Christ. It is a testimony that will speak to us. With that backdrop, Let's enjoy hearing about the life of a faithful Catholic and how God has worked in her life and the plans that she has to exercise her faith on a new level. Welcome to the show, Teresa. It's a blessing to be here, Bill. Thank you. My pleasure. It is truly my pleasure to have you on board. So talk to us about your journey to faith, uh, the early stages of God opening up your heart? Well, um, at the age of eight, I'll just give you a little background of my upbringing. Well, at the age of eight, I had made my communion, and 11 years old, I made my confirmation. But I had no connection with my Catholic faith. But looking back, I realized it was just like a ceremony. But my upbringing was a house without God. My father and mother um, were there by title, but not by action. So I had a very uh, small catechism. My catechesis was not at all in the atmosphere of my home. So the atmosphere basically was dark. My father was uh, an adulterer, owned a bar, which added fuel to all the negativity in my home environment. And my mom was uh, indulging in alcohol until she became blessed and became born again. And she worked um, with Pat Robinson as a Christian counselor at the 700 Club for many years. They're both deceased at the moment. However, um, coming back to the house where I grew up, it was very dark. It even had a name. It was called The House, where everybody flocked and hung out. Um, but, you know, when I look back, it reminded me of, like, the Woodstock scene, the house of ill repute, you can say. Then um, I took a plunge into a decadent lifestyle in Manhattan's party scene. And that's when my journey started to begin. Believe it or not, it happened on the dance floor in 1979 at Studio 54. Um, All of a sudden, I remember I was propped by this voice that revealed to me, what am I doing here? I said to myself, what am I doing here? This is all empty. This was the beginning of my conversion that led me to the truth. And then I decided to walk away from the ungodly lifestyle at that moment. Should I continue? Tell us about when you were on that dance floor at Studio 54, you had this revelation. What am I doing here? And you saw the world obviously differently. You began to see yourself differently. And was it was it a conscious thought was it like you were saying of a voice in your head and what followed 
that night or the following day or the following week? You know, how did your whole being, your, your psyche, follow up on that thought, what am I doing here? I, I, I remember I was dressed in this uh, very expensive outfit, and uh, I think it was uh, Mick Jagger's wife was playing Brown Sugar at the time, 1979, and I just looked around and I stopped and I, I, lo- I looked at the people dancing. What prompted me was realizing how empty everything was, and then I realized this is not real. I, I need to get out of here. I'm 19 years old now, so I'm thinking these thoughts. And um, I think was the uh, what really like got me disgusted was the repetitiveness of the music. After a while, it just goes in your head over and over again. And then you get up and do the same thing. And then all the drinking and all the drugging. And I, I just got very tired of it and disgusted. No, there's got to be another way. And then a voice invaded my mind. Not, I didn't hear it audibly, but in my heart. It was like an epiphany happened. Like I stopped in the middle floor, completely stood still. But everything was moving around. I felt all the vibration. And I said, no, I, I, have, to, I have to leave this place. And I literally walked out of Studio 54 and went outside and sat under a tree and was talking to God. Help me, God. What do I do? Where do I go? This is empty. This is dark. I don't want to be here. That's all I remember. That's an experience where, you know, you're coming to yourself. It's like, you know, the parable of the prodigal son when he's off spending his life in riotous living and then realizes after he's starving and feeding the swine, his father has plenty of food, and he finally came to himself, where he saw that the life he was living was, in fact, empty. Uh, It was going nowhere. And the only real reality that made any sense was returning to the father. And so as you sat under that tree, uh, I think it's sure that um, you know, God was reaching out to you, you were reaching out to him. And you know, that's what we like to communicate to people, that there truly is a threshold that we cross. And we recognize, like Ecclesiastes states, you know, all is vanity and it all is repetitive. Mm-hmm. Nothing new under the sun. And you know, I came to the same place in my life, and, and frankly, Teresa, it was the same year, 1979. It was mm-hmm. uh, in December of 79, and I said the same thing. Is this all that life has to offer? I just sensed in my heart of hearts there had to be more to life. There had to be a fulfillment that went beyond what the world offered, and I think that's where you were. You sense, yes, that you, what we what we begin to sense is that there has to be, and of course there is, a spiritual reality to this world. You know, our optic nerves, our eyes cannot see the spiritual reality, but we know that our Creator created something in our hearts to search for Him, to search for the truth, to search for the spiritual dimension of life, and you know, it's safe to say that. You crossed the threshold the same year I did. So, mm-hmm. so here you are under the tree. You're coming to yourself, you know, spiritually speaking. And God would continue to guide you know, your path. And if you'd like to fast forward to the time that uh, you were in Rome, or anything between sitting under the tree in Rome that led to your journey to Rome. Let's pick it up there. Yeah, sure. Um, After uh, I abandoned all my ungodly lifestyle, 
um, I still was searching. I stumbled upon a book written by Thomas Merton. And what stuck out, it was called No Man is an Island. And I remember when I read in there, it said, everything in the world that, that glitters is an illusion. And I could, then I looked back in retrospect at Studio 54 and said, oh, that's what I escaped, the glitter. And the mm. false world that cannot make you happy. I, I was not happy. I was lonely. I was empty. I was searching for something to fill me. And the pounding of the music could never fill you. So as I was reading Merton, I was feeling this relief because the words were, I was drinking it. And it was, I was, a, I was only 19 absorbing all this. And Merton's such a great writer. And um, after that, uh, I walked into a church um, in Greenwich Village called Our Lady of Pompeii. And I met a woman, older woman. Uh, she be, actually was a daughter of Padre Pio. And then <laughs> that led me to Padre Pio. And then I can say I came to understand my Catholic faith more and more. This woman became my godmother, and she was definitely put on my path to uh, introduce me more into this wonderful world of, uh, I could say, like monastic, contemplative Catholicism that led me on that path. Um, before that, I was a ballerina, aspiring ballerina, and I left that world because that was in conflict with my life. And then I led into uh, natural medicine. And um, I ended up in Italy um, in 1990, because my roots, I'm, I'm Italian, I wanted to find my roots, and then I wanted to go to Padre Pio. I ended up um, in Assisi, and all I remember is I heard these voices chanting in this mountain, and I followed the voices, and I opened up this beaded curtain, the door was wide open, and there were nuns on their knees chanting to the Blessed Sacrament. A spirit literally took me <laughs> in my heart in the middle of these nuns, and I started praying with them. At that moment, I felt eclipsed around this holiness that I never felt. It was almost like St. Teresa of Avila, not to, to some degree, the ecstasy I could describe it as. And then I, I was having another conversion. I just think you're constantly having these conversions through your journey. And that's what really did it, was those nuns that I was surrounded around with the chanting. It was so peaceful. It was opposite of what I experienced in the world. And now I'm in Assisi in the mountain, <laughs> in the middle of uh, a nuns chanting. Yeah. And you felt at home. I could say I was crying. I, there was a burning going on in my soul. I felt at home. I felt complete. How do I describe it in words? It was so profound. Yeah. It was, it was at home. I was at home in my soul. Now that's uh, what the world can never offer. And, you know, what those of us who know what it means to be set free by Jesus Christ, we know that there is a divine threshold that we cross. There, there's a difference in our being. You know, we do, as Peter says in his first letter, take on the divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. You know, this, mm. this mystery, this mystical occurrence to go from flesh and blood, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But like you say, and even throughout the book of Acts, like the apostles, they experienced numerous thresholds, um, revelation, direction, uh, inspired to pray in certain ways, inspired to reach out in certain ways. 
this is all the hand of God. I mean, he's at work within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. But there are moments in our lives that we look back and we know it's like almost like spiritual lightning where our whole body just lights up with this warmth of a spiritual reality that's present within us. And I know that to be true, and you know, you're, you're sharing the same thing. Um, and, you know, God works with us in different ways. In your case, you're in the company of nuns, women who have dedicated their lives mm-hmm. to the Lord Jesus Christ, and their impact changed your life. In a second. And that's how powerful the the Holy Spirit is. I was drinking divine the, the water that Christ said at the well. I, I I you'll never thirst again and I and I felt wow. I felt like I'm not what I was anymore. I'm a new creature. But that's that's arriving. You know, you know that you know without doubt that you are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that understanding and thank God that that's the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So, so, So there you are in Rome and you have this undeniable spiritual experience that you know something's happened, something's changed. And your life is never going to be the same. Talk to us about the thoughts that followed either immediately or sooner after, the following day, the following weeks, how that experience would begin to shape the rest of your life. Um, well, after a CC, I ended up in uh, Padre Pio. And when I walked in his church, there was another burning in my soul. I was consumed with a burning and tears flowed out of my eyes, but they were tears of joy, I remember. And I said, is this real? Have I touched heaven on earth? And everything happened. I didn't have a place to stay. And then I asked this priest, oh, I need a hotel room. And then I got the, ho- I got the room uh, across from the way. Um, I, I, I didn't know the scripture well at the time, so things were happening. Gui- everything was being guided, I felt, by the Holy Spirit at that time. I had total trust that God was now going to take care of me and guide me. I'm, I'm in Italy alone. I don't speak the language. And I just went out on faith to go to these places. Um, what followed after that was um, another experience. I ended up in a monastery. <laughs> Someone said, do a, do a novena for nine days, which I did. And then I end up in this monastery with Father Domenico, who knew Padre Pio. So, and I was, that was an experience that I was crying every day. And I remember a nun said to me, give your soul into the tabernacle to Jesus and he will bring it back to you white as snow. But you must be alone in the suffering with Christ. You can't be attached to anyone because he's purifying you. And you must go through this purification. And I still didn't understand. And she talked about the scars and I remember the scars. She says, those scars will never leave you, but remember always to give your emotions to God, not to the world. I took that home with me back to America, and I always pondered that in my heart and remember that. And then uh, changes were happening. My personality was changing. My clothes changed. My mind changed. I no, no, no longer looked at the world as an enemy in a sense it is an enemy what i mean by i'm not fighting anymore to try to fit in i felt right i i'm in this place now 
and all my suffering now, I know how to suffer because she told me to suffer in Christ, which I didn't know what that was. I had to go that far, 7,000 miles, to be in this monastery to teach me how to suffer in Christ and how to be at peace with that suffering and this union and this marriage and this betrothal with Christ. Amazing experience. Mm. So, so you know that you are going through your own transformation. Mm-hmm. It's God at work in you. As, you. as you say, you don't see the world as an enemy, and we're not trying to fit in. I can identify with that. You're, you're, you're basically understanding that you're a spiritual pilgrim in a fallen world. Mm-hmm. The world itself, the people in the world are not the enemy. They're, they're in desperate need the way we once were prior to knowing the truth. And we are lights of the world. So, yes, you know, we don't have to fight against the world that we thought was fighting us. Because now we've already won this spiritual war through Jesus Christ, and we know that. We continue to be purified, even as we are pure by the Holy Spirit, and we continue through this transformation. It's, right. it's being at peace with yourself and, and being at peace with God through Christ. That's what being reconciled means, bringing back together that which is once separated. Christ reconciled us to God. And with that, we have peace with God. So it's a... It's a feeling that transcends everything. There's nothing the world can throw at us that will disturb that. So thank you for sharing that about the world is no longer an enemy. You know, it's, it's, we understand the spiritual reality of the world. You know, we understand the powers of darkness in the world. That's the true enemy. But we have greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Mm-hmm. So thus, the world's not the enemy. Uh, we reach out to the world, and in talking to you, you know, you have pushed the envelope, you know, in your own walk with Christ, in exercising your faith, reaching out to the world. And I know you've shared some examples with me. Uh, I know, um, for example, when you were in Washington Square Park, um, perhaps you could talk about that. I know you were down south, and there's another ministry you were talking about. So talk to us about how you know, you've gone through this beautiful threshold, this divine threshold. And I think it's important for our audience to know that this, this is a real spiritual experience that Christ wants us to have, that we know we are his and he is ours. And we have mm-hmm. this whole new relationship with him and the world. Where you, now, <clears throat> instead of the world being the enemy, you desire to reach out to the world as I do. So talk to us about your exercising of this powerful faith that you knew now that you had. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Well, before my heart was overwhelmed by the debauchery, and I was, at, I was at a fight with this. And it, that was getting inside of me, all those irritations. I was trying to be this, uh, figure it out. And then I realized, no, Teresa, you have to step aside and surrender. And then you become the vehicle and the instrument. Don't try to control. Let God do the controlling. So I had to learn that, even in the conversion process. You know, to take heed and, 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 and put aside my uh, wanting to do it, surrender it to God. And then I understood once I did that, things flowed, flowed smoothly. For instance, uh, last week, uh, this homeless woman, uh, I carry Bibles and rosaries with me as part of my ministry. She was asking for money, and I gave her some. 
then I said to her, I have something to give you that is worth more than money. She says, what is it? I said, here. It's a Bible. She looked at it. She began to cry. She co- and then she told me, I come from a very Baptist background, but now I'm homeless. She said to me, could I read you John? I forget what verse it was, but it's about um, God so loved the world. As she was speaking it to me, she rivers of tears flowed from her eyes. She couldn't even utter the words. She was having a, her own conversion experience at that moment. It was a sight to see. I said, Lord, thank you. I began to pray with her. I said, T.T., it's okay to cry. She says, but I feel God doesn't forgive me. I said, yes, he does. So these are the things that happen now that I'm just trusting. I'm not afraid to approach like Christ approached uh, Matthew, was it, at the boat? Follow me. So the souls are out there, and I think we just have to not be afraid and bring that light to them. So T.T. accepted the light, the Bible, and the rosary, and she gave me a big hug. So, you know, things like that happen, and we just have to let it happen and get ourselves out of the way and let Christ operate in us, let his will operate, and not our human will. That's uh, that's really a moving story, Teresa. I mean, it's almost like, you know, Peter and John, you know, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk from Acts chapter 3. You actually gave her, you know, a monetary blessing that I'm sure she desperately needed. But then... Like Peter and John, you looked on her and you said, I have something greater to give. That's, that's the book of Acts in the first century, right. living in the 21st century. You're, you're carrying out the Acts of the Apostles. That's exactly what they did. They saw a need and they brought Christ into the picture. That's such a great example, Teresa. Thank you for sharing that. That really mm-hmm. touched my heart deeply. Yeah, she was reading John three sixteen. Yes. For God so loved for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm sure that's what she read. Yes, John three sixteen. She literally said, "I'm going to read John three sixteen, and that's what she yeah. read. She did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, she was raised, you know, in the church, um, Protestant. She said Baptist. You said Baptist, correct? Mm-hmm. Baptist. Yeah. So she had you know, plenty of understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ and, you know, raise a child up in the way that he should go when he, she is old. She will not depart from it. I mean, you brought back to her something she probably had buried way down your soul years ago and you just the love of Christ is welled up within her it's a beautiful story beautiful testimony mm-hmm. yeah. and you were at Washington Square Park not too long ago you know we've been dealing with this you know social unrest throughout the country you know people are angry for all the obvious reasons and and certainly, you know, there's plenty of empathy to go around. Um, you know, our responsibility is not to tear down and destroy, but ours is to love as he loved. We have a very different approach to those who are angry. You know, not to get angry at them, but to you know, love them with the love of Christ. And you did just that. Talk about that story. Yeah, well, Washington Square Park was another interesting uh, experience. There was, uh, I remember, there was a big demonstration going on. Uh, There was screaming and yelling, uh, a lot of civil unrest, a lot of people in desperation. But there was a group over to the right, I remember, about uh, six kids and teenagers. And I approached them. I just asked them, do you believe in God? And one boy, he pushed up in my face, not too close, but close enough. 
no, I hate Jesus. I said, why? What did Jesus do? And then he said, well, Jesus never did anything for me. And his followers are hypocrites, you know, and all these rules I have to follow. Why do I have to follow them? I told him basically, well, Jesus does not force you to do anything. He accepts you and loves you as you are, young man. He never pushes himself on you. He just invites us to experience beauty and love, his love, his divine love. And then he got more angry (laughs) and uh, he used some foul language. And I said, it's time for me to walk away. And then when I walked away, I just looked up to God, you know, help me, Lord, (laughs) help them, you know. But I dropped a seed here and there. But it was getting a little, um, the others were getting angry. So, and with the demonstration going on, I decided, you know, it's time for me to just leave the park. And um, what else? Uh, I came across yesterday. You you definitely planted seeds. You know, despite the fact that you were met with anger, they will never forget that exchange. I I guarantee you that everyone within earshot of your conversation will never forget that exchange. And you never can know a week from now, month from now, a year from now, maybe one person will remember what you said and will realize the same thing you did at Studio 54. And Mm -hmm. the Word of God never comes back void. So then you exercise wisdom, you exit stage right, which is a smart thing to do. I mean, there's no open door at that time, uh, but there very well could be through you by way of Christ at a later time for someone with their threshold. So, you know, that was another story where you, you know, get out of yourself as a human being and, step into the shoes or sandals of Jesus Christ and what would he do? And there you are. So now in your, in your walk, you, you have formulated, you, you know, pulled together your thoughts and you were inspired to create a ministry called Set Me Free. And, yes. and talk to us about that this ministry that you have created and how you share Christ with others through it. Sure. I just back up a little bit and tell you how it began. Um, During COVID epidemic, um, I began a Bible study via conference call with a small group every night. This went on for like four months, every single night, together studying the Word of God with all the death and gloom and doom that was going on. I mean, people were dying, like you've heard in New York City. I mean, we're talking, I think it was 7,000 a week. A thousand a day, sometimes 2,000 a day. And we were like clinging to each other every night in this Bible study. And we, I think like we shielded ourselves with the Word of God. That's how it began. And... Um, now I have it twice a week. I have uh, a Jewish woman, uh, Deborah. Um, she comes in faithfully. She's very interested in, in Jesus Christ. I, excuse me, have several other people, and uh, they're all Catholics, but most of them are sort of like uh, lukewarm, you can say. And my, one of them uh, was uh, evangelical, now came back to her Catholic faith through the Bible study. So I'm guiding her along the way with that. And um, Set Me Free is basically, it's, I would like to ignite, you know, keep the voice of God alive, you know, bring about a change in the world. That's what I'm hoping that it will do. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Now, the biblical verse that prompted the title of your ministry is John 16, 33, and I'll take the liberty to read that. 
I have okay, said these I will. things. Yes, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. And you had talked about in your letter to me that the peace Jesus offers us is free. When Jesus becomes the goal, there is freedom. And then you wrote, as I encounter the lives of many, I am given the opportunity to evangelize. It is dire that we all participate in the battle of spiritual warfare. So well stated, Teresa. Yes. Only in Christ we are free. There's no other freedom. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, John 8.32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I mean, you know, people do have to recognize that their own human frailty is, is going to eventually leave them empty. Some people come to that realization, unfortunately, some people don't. But when they do, that's when we are there with Jesus Christ. Just like when you were there with that homeless woman with the Bible. And that could be a mm-hmm. threshold that you know, we have no idea where that threshold's going to go. But we, um, the Holy Spirit, what really. Hmm? Go ahead, Teresa. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking of. Um, when Jesus said what really inspired was, he said, I have come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. And I, I feel that that's my vision, to spark that blaze again. So mm. I'm hoping to fan this flame through the radio show, of that, you know, through the ministry, you know, and yes. may it never extinguish, may it never extinguish that flame. I love your passion. Now, the radio show. Of course, what we're talking about now is this, you know, radio show um, that one example is the show you're on right now, Treasures in Heaven, of course. And Mm -hmm. talk to us about, and I, I love what your intentions are to host the radio show and under the you know, guys of the Set Me Free ministry and your vision for that show and you know, the people that you tend to bring on to interview, including, for example, Catholic artists. Mm, yeah, um, my vision is, I'm hoping what I just said, <laughs> to set this fire, a resurgence, um, in other words, to come out from behind the pews, go out into the streets, and hoping that through the ministry, people will live a more radical holiness, become the gospel people we were meant to be, instead of being stuck in the pew around the church trappings. We need to go bring the church out into the world. The church, the world is entering into the church and bringing that dark spirit, but we have to counteract that with the culture of death that's around us and bring the culture of life through the Bible, through the Word. The Word is life, the Logos, the life. And um, I'm hoping to set that blaze that Christ, you know, in the, the Gospel of, uh, of St. Luke, of St. Luke spoke about, I have come to set the earth on fire. We need to set the earth on fire, the Holy Spirit fire. Because the fires that are burning now in the cities, if we could reach that, those people, those kids, and bring that Holy Spirit fire in the midst of all these other fires, that would be a blessing. Yes. Yes, the fire of the Holy Spirit and the peace of Christ would certainly transform what we're looking at right now. So, so with your vision for the show, which is clearly laid out, um, I love the fact that you want to bring, you know, the church out into, you know, the world of uh, the lost, and you have an opportunity to interview people 
on the show to share their gifts as well. Can you give an example uh, when you talk about um, integrate your artistic gifts and invite other Catholic artists to share their gifts? Can you give an example of that? Um, well, I'm an artist and a singer-songwriter. Um, I feel that the Catholic artists can use, share their art as an expression for, as the expression of their love for God. And I believe art can bring conversion, a blessing to the visual, to the, to the, when the eye gate, when the eye gate sees it, that in the eye gate that's visualing, seeing all the negative, dark things in the world. We as Catholic artists can bring the light of Christ to our art. I have um, a friend who uh, works with rappers. And um, I've been working with her. Now she's becoming a devout Catholic. And now she no longer wants to work in the rapper's world, but she wants to work in the Christian music, music world. So that's just one example of how... What a beautiful testimony. What a beautiful testimony. <laughs> yeah. what, a, what a threshold. And, and this, and this, she has... this woman, she, um, you met her because I think she's involved in your business in some way and because she's a client of, she was a client of mine she was a client of mine Beautiful. and became a friend and she worked with the top rapper rapper artists and she tells me how dark it is now today she's basically moved to, removed herself out of that and now she's working more on a smaller scale with, with more positive singers mm-hmm well, look at the impact, Teresa. I mean, this this woman who is enmeshed to, or immersed, I should say, in the rapper world, and you come along and just be who you are, a light to the world, a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And your love and your light spoke to her. Mm-hmm. And... You're offering her what she needed and perhaps didn't really realize it. That's who you are with your ministry. And I think God is at work within you mightily to willing to do with his good pleasure to reach people that no one else could reach the way you could. So I think that having a radio show is going to open up a whole new dimension to reach people the same way you do personally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's fabulous, fabulous, the way you want to expand exercising your faith in reaching out through radio. So now talk to us about your studio. Uh, you Excuse me, what was that? Together with, Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, studio, my recording studio? Yeah, your recording studio that God inspired you to create. Now you get to use it to its potential. Talk to us about that. I began um, recording uh, with um, who I thought were Christian, uh, art, uh, recording uh, producers. Well, it started in Miami, actually, <laughs> yeah. Living in Miami Beach, I had a music ministry with children, and these children were so broken. They were into Santeria, the families. They were Catholic, but it was mixed because they came from Cuba. And the parents allowed me to take these children to the church. They were like from 9 to about 11. And um, I started a teaching them the rosary, and then we built a music ministry. It was called the Children of the Fiat. I chose Fiat because of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let it be. So, um, and these children had earrings in their nose, but they loved me, and they looked for me. Where is Teresa? They call me Mother Teresa a la Playa, which means Mother Teresa of the Beach. So, yeah, I went every week, twice a week, picked them up. I had a pickup truck. They'd jump in the back, and they would sing Ave Maria, I taught them. 
And the one that came from Majigori, it was in English. Um, I can't think of it now. We're talking 25 years ago. But I trained them with this song, and they would go, Ave, Ave, Maria. And they loved just belting that out. So we, we were performing. I finally got into uh, the Catholic community where we started performing. I got, them, I got them focused on certain songs. I taught them guitar and some percussions, and we started performing. And then I had a friend who had a recording studio. He recorded us. I have the CD. Maybe one day I'll play it with the children singing on the radio show. Um, that started recording. And then when I came to New York... I uh, learned Logic, Logic as a program, from the Apple Store. The kids in the Apple Store, they're very knowledgeable, so they would teach me how to use it. And then I bought the equipment and I built my own studio here in my apartment, and I started composing and producing my own music. And um, I haven't done anything lately, <laughs> but I was hoping to use it one day. I'm asking the Lord, okay, Lord, when am I going to use this studio that I have sitting here in my apartment? And that's about it with that. <laughs> so with your studio, you'll be able to use that for the radio show. Yes, it has a very good um, uh, um, software with a very good microphone. Yes, and that could be somehow transferred to the internet mm -hmm. and via via radio, yes. Beautiful. Now, do you know, I mean, you talked about Christian artists, um, Christian musicians. I mean, you're a yeah, singer, a few. songwriter. Do you know, you know Catholic or Christian musicians? Yes, I do. Uh, I do know a handful. I had a Catholic cafe as well. Over here I built... And I was hoping to uh, get that going with music and, and Catholic uh, artists, filmmakers. It didn't pan out. There were some issues going on. However, yes, I know filmmakers, Catholic filmmakers, Catholic artists. And I'm trying to get Kanye West because my friend, the rapper woman manager, she's connected with him. And um, I'm reaching out to him because he's actually a born-again Christian. And he writes some amazing gospel music. Yeah. Beautiful. Great connection. Yeah, I'm looking for young Catholics to get them inspired, to get them on the radio show, let them share their talent, let them share their gifts. You know. I love the concept. It would be a great forum, you know, a great outlet for that. Yes. So I think I think it's clear that you know your artistic talents can draw those with artistic talents and draw it out of them to present. And you know, sounds like you have the right scenario with the studio. You, uh, the passion you have to bring this forth. Uh, you know, it's a it's it's beautiful to behold, Teresa. It's wonderful. So, I think also, I think the arts, um, we can really um, minister through the world, through the medium of art, uh, Christian art, in a powerful way, the message of the gospel. Oh, without question. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, music... You know, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. David was a musician. And, you know, singing or playing with joy in your heart to the Lord in song, um, mm -hmm. it's a great testimony. It, it reaches people on a whole new level with, you know, the mind involved, the heart involved. Uh, I mean, I there are some songs out there I've played over and over. I never get tired of it because... It just reaches right into my soul about about Jesus Christ, and it's a fabulous way to just have scripture in your head and have faith in your head, you know, to you know change your whole disposition just to hear that you know beautiful 
artistic presentation. So sounds like, Teresa, this ministry that you have uh, is going to open some doors for some people who are talented, including yourself. And yeah. the radio show would open up that door to a whole new audience. It's, a, it's the work of God. So, so you've come a long way since you were in Studio 54, looked at what you saw, listened to what you heard, and said, this isn't it. This, this is not reality. This is the illusion. That's mm-hmm. the illusion that the Prince of the Power of the Air offers. You know, I think about um, how the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. And we know that's what we're dealing with. The prince of the power of the air deceives. And, you know, we are God's hands. We are his instruments here on earth. And, you know, you literally have instruments with your artistic talent that God can work through you and and by you for his purposes. And, you know, it's a blessing to have this exchange. Um, I mean, I'm a better person because I know you. You're a blessing (laughs) to my life. You're a blessing to ours as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a a regular love fest we have, I think, at the uh, online or the uh, phone line Bible study. Um, I fully enjoy it. So you've come a long way since you were 19 in Studio 54. You've had so many experiences, you know, particularly in Rome, and um, interacting with your kids down in Florida, and the interactions you've had here in New York, you know, the way you reach out to people to bring them together, something as straightforward as the phone Bible study, to act as a shield, you know, and a source of comfort, you know, during a time of great crisis. I mean, obviously, God's at work within you. And it's it's wonderful to be able to, you know, break bread, so to speak, um, with someone like yourself. Now, talk to me about the Word of God, scriptures. I know that you talked about how John 16:33 is the prompt, is the spiritual foundation to your set me free ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to read that again. Where Jesus said, "I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation." So that scripture spoke to you. Talk to us about other scriptures that have spoken to you or mean something to you or have meant something to you, you know, the words of Christ himself? Sure. Um, one, one scripture I meditate upon, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these brethren, you have done it unto me. So whatever we do, as I go out, I encounter the homeless, the brokenhearted with the children. We are encountering Christ in them. I even wrote a song about it. One day I'll share it with you. So I view that passage, and there's another one that uh, I really love uh, with John 4.14. Whoever drinks of the water I give him, he will never thirst again. So I feel like when I pass those Bibles out and give them the rosaries, we're giving the water of Christ, the fountain, the everlasting. And then another one pops out. I love Matthews. <laughs> the one that talks about the sheep, that Christ uh, talked about what do you, uh, when he says, if any man had a had hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search for the one that is straying. They're all straying out there. And we are the ones to go and be the fishers of men. Take the the net, throw the net. Right. Mm -hmm. 
they, people like Mother Teresa we have to be. We have to touch them. And I have, my, I have these rosary bracelets. A kid yesterday, homeless, about 18 years old, I looked at him. I said, I have something for you. I said, give me your hand. And I put, uh, he wanted an orange one. I have all different colors. I put it around him. And he looked at me. Yeah, he's just, he, we give it, we're blessing. We want to bring blessings to the world. There's so much unblessedness. We want to be a blessing onto others. Well, you gave three scriptures that are so front and center, so paramount to our high calling in the Lord Jesus Christ. That which you do to the least of my brethren, that you do unto me. And there you are reaching down to a homeless woman, looking to lift her out of her current state. And you have this high calling. You, you live it, you talk it, you breathe it. It's who you are. And yes. that's what this new covenant is all about. You know, you're an example of that that, you know, it's certainly not punching in and punching out on Sunday morning. It's, and so we had in our Bible study earlier about repentance, it becomes a way of living where we just live a living sacrifice. We become living sacrifices, as Paul said, in the way we live our lives. It's just a life of doing the right thing, a life of repentance, always wanting to be right in the sight of God, and bending our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, not our will, but thine, my Lord, be done. And Amen. that's exactly what you're talking about in the, in the scriptures you quoted. So we're almost at the end of the show, Teresa, and... <laughs> So if we were to, or if you were to sum up what you would want people to know about Christ, what would you say? I would say, if you want to know Christ, look at that person next to you, because Christ is in them, and don't judge them. I think we need to step out beyond, I said before, the pews. Go out into the streets and live that light, the radical holiness. We can't just sit in the pew and keep it to ourselves. We have to take the light out into the world on the hilltop, not keep it under the rug. We have a fallen world out there, and we're the ones that Christ anointed us with to take his message to the whole world and be that light. Become a gospel people and build the kingdom of God in this fallen world. That's what I would say. Go out and become a gospel people. Well stated. Well stated. It's who we are. It's a lifestyle. And thank God that it is a lifestyle. And thank God that we are knowledgeable enough to respond to this high calling. You know, the harvest is great and the laborers are few, and we recognize that. There's an urgency to the times. We see it every day. So it's that sort of... uh, It's not a uh, compulsion. It's an inspiration. We're inspired to reach out, to live up to, and be fulfilled by this high calling we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are, Teresa, a shining example of that. And I am blessed to be able to say that and blessed to know you. So I'm going to close with prayer, but first I want to say thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you for having me. It was a blessing to be 
part of this tonight. Amen and amen. So let me close with one of my favorite prayers from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. In the last amen. two verses in Jude. So from all of us at WCAT Radio, thank you for tuning in. God bless you and good night. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. To a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.